So tonight we have one of our bonus lectures on caring for post-operative patients. As a surgical FY1, you'll be expected to manage patients returning from theatre. Tonight we introduce the excellent Dr. Sadiq Moladina, who trained at Cambridge University and is currently an academic clinical fellow in cardiology. He has a vast amount of experience managing the acutely unwell patient, having spent time working in the Royal Brompton Intensive Care Units. He is going to focus his lecture this evening on the practical tips that will be useful for you before you embark on your first foundation jobs. So without further ado, over to you, Sadiq. Perfect. Thanks very much for that introduction, Alice. So my name is Sadiq. I'm a cardiology registrar. Um, thanks for all of you guys tuning in. It's great to see so many people. Um, and what I, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was post-operative care. I think my understanding is that most people who have tuned in are finally a medical students or just started um, as F1s. So what I thought would be useful is post-operative complications um, is quite a broad topic and quite vast um, and it will be almost impossible to cover sort of everything that could come up. So just to really pick a few cases and hone in on some important points and by no means will this be a lecture on sort of pathophysiology or up-to-date guidelines, but more sort of what, what you would do as the, you know, F1 on call um, and things like that. So in terms of sort of background of what I want to cover um, is it's just that recognising that post-operative patients are often can be very sick and they may well be the sickest patients in the hospital. Um, and as the on-call F1 or two, or even during your normal working hours, you will often be the first to see these patients. Um, and often the first to recognise that they are indeed deteriorating. Um, they do deteriorate very, very quickly and recognising this early um, is, is key. Um, and regardless of whether you do medical jobs, surgical, orthopaedics, um, all of you will get called to see unwell post-operative patients. So um, again, so as I sort of mentioned, so the objectives of this talk are just to give an overview of common situations you may face on call and give you really sort of a systematic way that you've been taught all throughout medical school, um, but just with sort of practical things that you would do on the ward. Um, it's also important, I think, just to think about who to escalate to, when to escalate um, as well. So I'll start with the, with the first case and what I thought I'd do is the first case give quite a comprehensive sort of syst um, systematic way of going through the patient and then in the subsequent cases after that we can go through um, a bit more quickly of what, what exactly um, is going on. So first case is, um, I'll give you a second, uh, a 68 year old gentleman who's post-op for um, his gastric cancer and it's something that you'll sort of commonly get called about I mean this guy he hasn't nurses are worried that he hasn't passed much urine he's a bit hypotensive and tachycardic so um what I'll do is I'll start with sort of my 80 assessment of him and then sort of just go through um fully what what to do so um we'll touch back on this a little bit later but the salient features are this gentleman is hypotensive he's tachycardic and he's got a tender abdomen um, and in terms of sort of differentials and practical steps of what to do, I think differentials are quite broad, but given the sort of hypotension and tachycardia and the abdominal pain, I think you'd be, you'd be worried about post-operative bleeding. So um, just a little bit firstly about post-operative bleeding is that they can range from sort of, you know, really sort of minimal to life-threatening and um, there's different types and they can be stratified according to primary reactive or secondary. Um, primary bleeding you won't often unless you're in theatre because this is what occurs during the actual procedure itself you won't really be sort of that involved in it unless you're um, you're there but um, often if they have had a bleed during procedure they may be more likely to develop a bleed later on um, and you may already be aware of how much blood they've lost. Um, reactive bleeding is sort of up to 24 hours or after the operation then you get a sort of secondary bleeding which is seven to ten days after the operation itself so um, oops. so in terms of sort of the signs or the symptoms or um, of a post-operative bleed the things that you really want to look for is your the, one of the early features is that they'll become tachyneic um, hypertension is something that can trick a lot of people because you know you might feel that patients would have to have quite a low blood pressure to have lost a lot of blood but um, frankly speaking that's completely not true you can have lost a fair bit with them um, and maintain a normal blood pressure and they'll look unwell um, if they're having a big um, 
a big bleed. They'll be clammy. They'll have cold peripheries. Um, they might not be perfusing very well um, their end organs, so they could be confused, not passing much urine. Um, and I think the first thing, sort of, you know, is looking for an obvious site of, of where and where they're bleeding. Is there any obvious external bleeding? Any tenderness, sort of, around the surgical site? Any sort of hematomas or peritonism? So there is a classification of hemorrhagic shock and it's classified from one to four. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is firstly, as I've already mentioned, the blood pressure side of things. So, you, you know, you're losing a lot of blood. You're losing sort of up to two mils or greater than two mils before your blood pressure starts to um, drop. And obviously your, you know, your cardiac output is your heart rate times your stroke volume. So you're going to, you're going to compensate and become, you know, your heart rate is going to increase to uh, maintain that cardiac output. But, you know, you could be losing up to 30 to 40% of your blood before you notice a drop in your blood pressure, the urine um, tailing off. So it's just to be, um, just to be aware of that, that, you know, they can in the initial stages not present that unwell. So I think the things in terms of practical steps and just going through this case in a step-by-step -step fashion. So the first thing you'll happen is that you'll get called by the nurse. Um, and I think given the vitals of this patient, given the fact that they're 24 hours post-operative, um, it's quite important that, you know, you see the patient fairly urgently and ask the nurse um, or whoever's looking after the patient or whoever calls you to put some continuous monitoring equipment um, on the patient you know if um, you know make sure that they've got um, regular blood or continuous blood pressure regular um, oxygen saturations and then you can really see what their heart rate and respiratory rate is and you know putting I don't think there's you know anything wrong with it if you're worried that this patient might arrest um, getting the pads on a patient quickly because um, if they do go into a shock or rhythm or something it is something that's uh, worth considering um, and we're going to just talk through this sort of AT assessment of this patient. I'm sure it's been sort of drummed in throughout medical school, but I'll try to go through a bit more of the practical steps that you would take. Um, and obviously, if they're not hosing out, then do your AT. But if they are, then just uh, I think in the first instance, it's just get some pressure, you know, get help, and stop try to stop the bleeding. So um, the other thing is just whilst you're on the phone with the with whoever's called you is just to clarify exactly what operation that they've had at the site and you know you can sort of focus your examination onto that and you know just try to work out intraoperative blood loss it will give you a good idea of how much they've already lost if they've had any replacement of blood um and sometimes you know surgical teams um will offer a particular management plan if they do become on again or they are high risk of re-bleeding Often you get called for, um, for example, uh, if you're doing a gastroenterology job um, post endoscopy, if someone's having a variceal or non variceal bleed, um, they might say that if they become hypertensive or unwell, then they'll rescope them or they'll clearly say no medical management. So uh, your examination step will be uh, so A to E. So first thing is uh, airway. So um, what I would say is if you're worried about the airway being compromised, then get help urgently put out a 2222 call or, um, and get hands on deck get anesthetics involved um, but practical things that you can do is if, if you're in that scenario whilst you're waiting for people to arrive is your sort of your ALS maneuvers so your head tilt chin lift um, if they've got noisy breathing you can try a jaw thrust and otherwise um, consider airway adjuncts um, so if they're semi-conscious I would use a, a nasopharyngeal airway but otherwise, you know, you can consider things like um, a Goodell. And obviously, after everything that you do, just reassess the um, intervention. But, but often you won't, I mean, when, when airway is compromised, you won't get um, necessarily called about it because uh, that will normally go out as um, a sort of emergency arrest or peri-arrest call. So in terms of your breathing, so... Um, a high respiratory rate is actually a very sensitive marker of post-operative bleeding. Um, so you're, you're going to compensate and you're going to breathe quite quickly due to sort of lack of hemoglobin. Um, if, the, if you are getting sort of, you know, if you are getting poor perfusion, so if, if you're having a massive bleed, you're not perfusing your brain, um, that can lead to reduced respiratory rate. But uh, tachypnea is more common. Um, I think obviously listening to the chest is of vital importance. Uh, if you're getting reduced air entry bilaterally, that can su suggest significant airway compromise and urgent critical care input. Um, and if it's just unilateral, then it's, it's thinking about things like a hemothorax. So 
um, and you know, a significant hemothorax can accumulate before a patient does start to feel unwell. Um, I think it's quite important to get an arterial blood gas um, and an x-ray. I'm a big advocate actually for, and I think if anyone, this is just generally in your surgical rotations or your medical, um, is if someone's unwell, uh, your sort of investigation, if you have one investigation of choice, is to get a, an arterial gas because, or a venous gas if you can't get it, because it, it will give you the most amount of information. It will give you sort of their metabolic status it will give you a lactate, it will give you um, a glucose and you know really you can see the oxygen saturations, venous saturations and you can sort of work out what's going on. Um, oxygen should be administered uh, ideally through, uh, if you're going for milliliters and the desaturation through a non-rebreathe mask um, and sort of your oxygen saturations are aiming between 94 to 98%. And if assisted ventilation is required, then again, it's important to get critical care involved at that point. So circulation, this is sort of where your money is going to be in terms of assessing the patient who's having post-operative bleeding. Um, they're going to be tachycardic due to a hypervolemia. And I think it's worthwhile checking several pulses um, so you can idea of what's going on and getting a feel for the character and things like that. Um, as I mentioned before, in terms of the hypertension, it's, you know, the patients are able to maintain their blood pressure. So it's, it's important not to be um, falsely reassured by a normotensive patient. So just think about those classifications, um, class one to four that I mentioned earlier. And then have a look at any sort of drains or catheters, because that can give you a clue if there's, um, if there's sort of hosing out of a, of a drain and you can quantify exactly how much they are. Um, you want to get in intravenous access as soon as possible because you're going to be needing to give fluids or bloods. Um, and the gold standard is two sort of large, big gray cannulas. Um, so the blood can go through um, without clotting. So get hands on deck and get those in quickly. Um, and then it's getting your urgent blood transfusion. So, um, you know, if your hospital has, most hospitals have a major hemorrhage team. So if you're concerned, then you can put out a major hemorrhage call or there's guidelines about um, what to do. But if, if in doubt, you get your own negative um, blood, you can ask for that. Um, and getting things like platelets and fresh frozen plasma. Um, also, you can do auto transfusion. So this is, again, you can position your patients with their legs up um, this is also quite a useful tip. So if you've got someone who you want to see as fluid responsive, and if they're, for example, they're in heart failure, and you don't want to necessarily give them bags of fluids, um, you can try this and just, you know, position them with their legs up and that should increase their venous return and um, essentially raise their blood pressure. So um, I think whilst you're waiting for your, whilst you're waiting for your bloods and things like that, then it's important to get IV fluids on board. Um, just to get some hemodynamic stability. So if you're having a large bleed, the resuscitation should be with blood and not with um, IV fluids for, for the long stay management. And really, I think only, only giving one to two liters of fluids is probably about the right amount so that you don't start third spacing. You don't want to replace the blood with sort of salt water. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're perfusing their kidneys, correcting electrolyte imbalances and um, restoring some circulatory volume as much as you can. And I think using something like saline or Hartman solution um, is probably the most appropriate thing for your initial fluid resuscitation. So whilst you're cannulating your patient, it's worth sending off blood um, and your venous gas at the same time. And the most important ones here with uh, your post-operative ble um, bleed patient is they should have a valid group and save in the lab already, but most trusts, they sort of, you know, you need a repeat one after three days. So um, if they haven't had that, um, then it's worth getting a second group and save. Um, checking their full blood count, you can see what their platelets are, their hemoglobin, whether you, how much you need to replace really looking at their clotting and again thinking about things like will they need things like tranexamic acid um looking at their kidney functions they may go into an acute kidney injury um and seeing if there's a you know a secondary process is there an infection or something like that going on as well i think if you're considering infection then it's worth taking blood cultures um being a, a cardiology reg, I'm always going to say get an ECG, but um, if I could sort of be an advocate for it, I think it will tell you quite a lot. So if uh, often 
you can you know you can really drop your blood pressure quite significantly um, and you can get secondary myocardial ischemia so it, it really is worth getting um, an ECG and it can give you some clues as to what's going on um, and getting some sort of cross-sectional imaging depending on where you're querying the bleed and how severe it is. So uh, moving on to sort of D, so your disability side of things. So um, having a look at your blood glucose levels, look at the pupils, are they equal? Are they reactive to light? How big are they? Um, calculating the patient's GCS or APU score um, is very useful because it gives you a clue in terms of how well they're perfusing um, their, how well they're perfusing um, their brain and whether you know it's causing causing drowsiness. And actually, recording a GCS level is very very useful because um, you can track progress um, and see how they're changing. So, and then exposing your patients. So um, it's, it's routine, I think, in this case, to expose unwell patients, make sure you're not missing anything. Um, if you're querying a GI bleed, uh, upper or lower, it's important to do a PR exam. Um, really, really important to measure their urine output. Um, and sometimes that's something that's often missed, um, unfortunately. And I think if you're querying a post-operative bleed, then it's important to catheterize your patient as well and just review their fluid balance chart quite regularly and know that these patients can become, again, you're losing a large circulatory volume, they can become hypothermic. So as I mentioned already, catheterize um, and then reverse the hypothermia so you can use blankets, consider rewarming techniques and, um, and get some wound swabs off and then you can reassess after any uh, intervention so i think looking at sort of just going back to my at assessment is quite quick it, um, it shouldn't take that long to do but uh, you can just really quickly pick up the main features that are going on um and i think given everything that's going on with this patient you can sort of put together that the most likely cause is a post-operative bleed I think with hypertension, it's important to consider other things. So your adrenal causes, for example, so patients might be on steroids, they might have been stopped abruptly pre-surgery, so they could go into an Addisonian crisis. Thinking of your cardiac patients, your low output, those with poor left ventricular systolic function, whether they're going to get poor um, perfusion to their end organs, and then sepsis as well. But uh, but each of these things will probably have their own clues um, and it will be sort of in, in your history and things like that as well. So I think that's just, I mean, it's quite, um, as in, it seems like a lot, but it will become very like second nature, but doing that comprehensive AC assessment um, will sort of lead you to the clues. And for example, this patient will be, you know, it's letting your gastro or letting your surgical registrar know that you're worried about the bleed, getting that initial resuscitation going for them and then organizing potentially some cross-sectional imaging and they may get taken back to theater. Right, so um, I'll move on to the second case, if that's all right. So um, our second case is something which is fairly common and I'm fairly sure that all of you will see this. Um, it's an 84 year old lady who's got multiple, several comorbidities. She's got atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and she's got polymargia rheumatica. She's had enough and she's day two post-operative. Um, and you're called to see her because she's drowsy, the nurses are worried, she doesn't look quite right, her breathing slowed down, and you know, she's been given a fair bit of pain relief post-operatively. So I'll give you a second just to have a little think about what do you do and what do you think is going on. So... So just summarising, I know we talked quite extensively about the A2 approach, but again, if there's concerns with A, your anaesthetic support, B, do those things, they listen to their chest, may require extra oxygen, gas them, think about abdominal causes of respiratory dysfunction, assess your volume status, measure your blood glucose and assess their neurology, and examine their abdomen, limbs, back, torso, everything. So for this patient, so her airway was, uh, she had her own airway, it was patent. So you can see here, so in terms of her breathing, her respiratory rate is 10. She's got shallow breaths, but equal air entry with no added sound. She's saturating okay. Her heart rate is all right. Her blood pressure is a little bit on the low side, but nothing particularly exciting. Uh, she's got normal heart sounds, no peripheral edema. 
blood sugar is 7.2. She has pinpoint pupils that aren't very reactive. Um, you can't really assess her neurology because she's sort of on the V heading to P on the AFPU scale. Um, and uh, her abdomen soft in terms of exposure. There's nothing else particularly exciting. So what's going on and what do you do next? So in terms of sort of investigations at the bedside, I'd say things that would be would be useful are to get a gas. Um, you can see that this patient's got a respiratory rate of 10. Um, you know, they've got pinpoint pupils. It kind of gives you an idea of what, what's going on. And, you know, you, you'll see this patient that they'll start retaining carbon dioxide. They're at risk of going into type 2 respiratory failure. Um, and it'll give you other clues like could they be drowsy because of a low blood I mean, you've got a pinprick and you've got blood sugar there but otherwise you could see um, your blood sugar you can see the lactate are they floridly septic or something like that um, and look at the drug chart of the patients um, I think that's vitally important something that often often gets missed um, and I think when you're when you're there when you're on call you've been called about this patient there's a couple of questions to ask yourself and and these are really like, can you manage this patient safely on the ward? I mean, it sounds like they're becoming unresponsive. Do you need? Do they need to be moved to an area where, with increased monitoring? Um, does your Does your team need to be in, uh, involved with this patient? Do you need help from other teams like medicine or ITU, for example? And these are the sorts of things just to um, just to start thinking about really um, when you're when you're there. So, I mean, um, this patient's had an opiate overdose. So this is quite common post-surgery that patients complain of pain um, and they just get given loads and loads of morphine. Um, and especially if they're old and they're comorbid and they've got, you know, other things going on, they're more likely to sort of, you know, it's less likely to be cleared by their kidneys. Um, and I would say for someone like this, where it's quite clear cut, you'll see on the drug chart, they've had loads of morphine, they've got pinpoint pupils, they've got a low respiratory rate, they give naloxone. Um, and I've just put up here, these are the guidelines. So initially you give 400 micrograms, then 800 up to two doses. It's important to remember that um, naloxone is very, very short acting. So we're sort of talking about half life of 30 minutes to an hour. So, um, if, if you are giving it, you are gonna reverse any pain relief that the patient is getting as well. So you do need to consider that if they were in significant pain pre going into this overdose state that you need to manage their pain um, appropriately. And just very briefly is the, the pain management ladder, which um, I'm sure has been, um, you guys have seen before, but you know, considering your non-opioid medications or your paracetamol whether to give it orally or IV and then moving up to things like your NSAIDs and uh, whether they need something like tramadol um, going into your opioids. I think a couple of just uh, things to think about with pain management are if you're giving NSAIDs um, then to um, consider giving a, a proton pump inhibitor such as a meprazole at the same time. Um, if you're giving your patients postoperatively a lot of codeine or morphine, then really consider things like constipation um, and nausea as well, because they can, they can um, contribute to both of those. Um, and again, looking at things like other interactions with other drugs, looking at your renal function of the patient. If they've got terrible renal function, don't give them morphine, for example. You can think about something like oxycodone instead. Right, so um, so going on to uh, our third case now. So this is, I'll just give you a second to read this, but it's a, um, uh, essentially it's a 67 year old woman who's day two post cholecystectomy. Um, and again, it's the evening shift. Everything always goes wrong in the evening or overnight, just as an FYI, but um, she's been spiking fevers for the past couple of days. Uh, no one's really thought much of it. Um, her oxygen saturations are okay-ish, but she feels more short of breath than normal, and the nurses are worried about what's going on. So again, do your go see the patient, do your A to E assessment, um, and actually you might find that what you're told over the phone is not necessarily true, and your your own opinion might be very different. So. Um, just picking out the salient features of this examination. So this patient's got a respiratory rate of 28. They've got saturations on the low side, 91% on room air. Um, they have coarse crackles at their right base. They're slightly tachycardic. 
Um, their capillary refill is three seconds. Um, their febrile at 38.1, but otherwise their examination is ab ab otherwise normal. So have a think about some of the differentials and practical steps of what to do next. And I'll give you 20, 30 seconds just to think about this um, before moving on. I think that's the difficulty with webinars sometimes is that you don't get that much time to think, you just get told things if it's not as interactive. So I'll try my best not to just keep talking. So in terms of differentials, I think the, the glaring one that people are going to think of is that this is an infective process um, and it's, it's sepsis. Um, and most likely it's a chest source given that, um, given that it's, uh, well, given the findings in the right base. But it's important, I think, to also think about uh, things like post-operative atelectasis and really think about PE um, as well with these patients. They're high risk post-op um, and they can present with fever. So don't be, um, don't be um, tricked by that. So on the ward, you get an urgent portable x-ray of the chest. And um, I don't know how well this is projected, but you can sort of see that there's a right lower lobe pneumonia. Um, other things that you would do is you'd get all the stuff that we've talked about already, like your arterial blood gas, your ECG, uh, your bloods and things like that. Um, ABG shows type 1 respiratory failure and you know, bloods with a CRP of 280, white cells of 18 with a, a neutral, um, neutrals of 14. And that, that really is giving you the clues of what, what's going on. Um, and I think the management is key and it's, it's something that will have been, you know, hammered sort of into you throughout medical school in the beginning of f1 is your sepsis six um everyone will see septic patients um and most of the time you'll pick it up but it can be easy to miss as well so and i would say for anyone who you do think is septic do the do the sepsis six um so this patient's saturations were 91 percent. so give them oxygen take blood cultures um you might find something exciting um, start them depending on what the protocols for the hospital are and I think there's useful things like micro guide um, depends on where you work but most places use that look at their um, look at their comorbidities because if they've got crashing heart failure just be very cautious with fluids um, and check serial lactates and really important to measure urine output so I think as a rough sort of guide like you should uh, just check their weight but um, you'd start to worry if their urine output becomes less than 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. Um, and probably at that point, you would start to think about whether you need to get a critical care or ITU involved. I think for this patient, given the fevers and x-ray finding, it points a little bit away from a PE um, and you've got crackles in the right base, but just remember that they can present the fevers. And this is again, uh, the, why your ECG is quite useful because, um, Although an ECG isn't a definitive test, it can give you clues that a PE is going on. Um, if it's a, if it's a PE causing, um, it's, you know, causing some sort of it can cause right ventricular strain. So you'll get it on your ECG. You'll see a right axis deviation. You might see a partial, complete right bundle branch block. You might also see the classical, you know, S1, Q3, T3 findings, but um, that's that's probably less likely. Um, and then it's important to make sure that their patient is anticoagulated. Most patients should, well, they should essentially, unless there's a, a reason why not in terms of they've got bleeding tendencies, they should um, be anticoagulated. I think it's difficult in terms of D-dimer. So if you send it, you're kind of... Um, you're kind of sort of not trapping yourself, but you're kind of committing yourself to cross-sectional imaging, but because their well score may well be high, um, given that they're post-operative and they're desaturating and you suspect a PE, but, um, but equally the D-dimer will be high. So then it, it, will be, it will be difficult to justify not giving them full treatment dose anticoagulation and doing cross-sectional imaging. So I think if it's quite barn door and clear cut like this, I personally wouldn't send a D-dimer. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about post-op pyrexia. So um, again, pyrexia post-operatively can be completely normal, but uh, the most common cause is infection. And uh, the specific day on which the fever develops may indicate the source of infection. So the first couple of days, it's really thinking about respiratory source. And then days three to five, consider a urinary tract source. And after that, it's more your surgical site infection or think about abscess or um, collections 
any day post operatively look at look at your um, central lines IV lines arterial lines things like that patients should have central lines changed um, fairly regularly uh, depending on how long they're there or if they're in ITU and look at the nature of the fevers are they swinging or continuous uh, an abscess for example might give you more of a picture of swinging fevers so this is a useful diagram that I stole. So wind is one to two days. Uh, so that's your respiratory pathogens. Or maybe actually in your in your sepsis six, maybe it should be sepsis seven. Actually send a COVID swab as well now. That's, uh, that's the new guideline, I think. So anyone who's got respiratory symptoms, um, get, a, get a COVID swab off and hopefully it will get processed. Um, water so that's your urine that's day three to five and then it's more your superficial and deep wound infections later on and think about drugs as well because they can cause post-operative um pyrexia so just a couple of other causes of pyrexia so um iatrogenic causes so think about antibiotics anesthetics uh, we've talked about already um venous thromboembolism um and then look to see if they've got prosthetic sort of implantation um but this case i think was fairly clear cut um that it wasn't the other things so um but if, if there's sort of any diagnostic doubt then it's worth thinking about these other other possibilities and i think uh, you know it's, it's cover your bases really so you know inquire about specific symptoms such as do they have urinary frequency or do they have any urinary symptoms in particular? Have they got a cough or hemoptysis? And then, you know, asking chest or cough pain, are their lines particularly painful or things like that? Um, serial blood cultures can also be quite useful. If they're coughing, send off a sputum sample and things like that. And really having a look at their IV line sites and um, really looking for cough tenderness and just looking for specific complications from the operations um, itself. So as the example here is pertinism in an anastomotic leak. So I just thought sort of in the last couple of uh, minutes that I would just talk about a couple of other common things without cases that you will see and just, um, just how to really deal with them. So post-operative ileus is something that you will, most of you will see um, in, in the patients that you deal with. And um, it's quite important in these patients just to have a, a rough idea of what might be causing it and um, how you manage it as well. So um, if you've got a severe ileus, you can get a, you can get a patient who perforates um, and it's really important to rule out mechanical obstruction. So risk factors of developing an ileus actually include abdominal surgery itself, um, looking at the things that we do to patients during an operation. So, um, you know, things like they will get electrolyte imbalances with fluid shifts. We give them a lot of pain medication, so narcotic pain can cause it. Um, and then looking at things like immobility, sepsis, um, and metabolic acidosis. And these are more things that will cause an ileus after non-abdominal surgery. So it's physiologic in, um, you know, in a abdominal surgery um, that you get handle the bowel and you get irritation of the peritoneum. So um, this will cause a ileus for up to three days. And in most cases, the small bowel regains function um, and then the stomach sort of, and it, the whole process takes about 72 hours. But if an ileus is continuing after this time point, then it may be a suggestive that there's a, a pathologic process going on, such as, uh, uh, sort of intra-abdominal bleeding or an abscess so it's worth thinking about that and um, things I think post-operatively the most important things are to check your electrolytes so once you've ruled out uh, there's mechanical obstruction and you can get cross-sectional imaging for example to do that or after discussing it with your um, surgical registrar or whoever but um, really correct the electrolyte imbalances so check your phosphate check your bone profile check a magnesium have a look at your sodium potassium your urine electrolytes um, and often it's you know things like people don't send a phosphate and they've got a phosphate of 0.2 um, and that's the reason that they're getting this post-operative ileus um, and again reviewing your medications are they on narcotics could that be causing it we talked a little bit about morphine and constipation and then just looking at patients, getting them up and moving, um, making sure they're not immobile. And again, that's also with, I think I briefly mentioned, um, post-operative atelectasis is really getting patients to take deep breaths in and out, getting them moving, making sure that they've got adequate pain release so that they are able to take deep breaths in and out and move around.
So the final thing that I just um, want to touch upon is something else which I'm, I'm fairly certain that all of you will see um, on the wards and that's post-operative AKI. Um, and it's very, very common and it's something which I think you would be expected to, um, to deal with. So um, it's worth knowing that patients who already have CKD are at higher risk and then it's things like heart failure, hypertension, Basically, if you're more atheroma than human, then you're at increased risk. Um, so just just bear that in mind. So those comorbid patients are going to are going to be at significantly increased risk, um, and it can be non oliguric. So looking at when patients they can have normal urine outputs, um, and especially in things like contrast induced nephropathy. So those those of you who go on to do a cardiology job or a vascular surgery job, um, your patients who have had endovascular operations um, they will have high doses of contrast um, and they can go into a non-oliguric AKI quite um, quite quickly and it's worth monitoring that. So this is probably a slide that's been uh, you've seen multiple times um, in terms of AKIs and what I would say is um, when you're there and you've noticed an AKI because the patient is either oliguric or because you've noticed it on their blood um, in the immediate setting, the things that I would do is just try to have a think about what the etiology of the AKI is. Um, and particularly the practical things that you can do whilst you're on the ward is to get a bladder scan and get a post void bladder scan. And you'll see if they're retaining, um, in which case you can, you can you know, introduce a catheter or you may have a catheter that's obstructed. Um, it's also worth reviewing their medication. So to see if there's any evidence of an acute tubal necrosis um looking to see uh, you know again is there an allergic reaction could it be an interstitial nephritis um sending off a renal screen is really important i think if you're not entirely sure of the cause um and then again looking at your pre-renal causes so look at the surgery the operation notes um do they have periods of hypervolemia have they during the post-operative period or hypertension during surgery are they known to have pre-morbid things like um, reduced cardiac output due to heart failure? Um, and I think those things are worth worth thinking about. So it's really getting your getting that bladder scan and getting ultrasound imaging of your renal tract, looking at your intrinsic renal causes and sending off the appropriate um, renal screen. And then you know if they if they require IV fluids, if they're not getting you know. Uh, enough so if they're hypoperfusing it's correcting that's um, vitally important but obviously if you don't know the etiology and you start pumping iv fluids into your uh, post renally obstructed patient you're going to probably do more harm than good so just um just really be aware of that i think um because it is something that you will see so i think in summary um we've talked about talked about some of the most common things that you will see um post-operatively and um, I think if you take that sis, uh, systematic approach of going through slowly or going through your A to E, you're, you're less likely to miss things and, you know, you'll do quite a comprehensive um, assessment. I'd say in terms of practical things, being on call can seem quite lonely and it can seem quite scary in terms of that you feel that like you're dealing with very sick patients and there's not an obvious amount of help there. But um, it's really, I think it's just worth remembering that in the hospital, you're essentially, you're very rarely alone and there will be a lot of senior support available. Um, if you are worried about patients, I would always escalate within your own team. And if you can't get hold of someone, you're not getting the response in, that you want is um, getting other teams uh, involved is absolutely fine but uh, uh, but yeah um any questions at all thank you thank you sadiq that was great we do have a few questions if you have time so we have a few questions in the chat um oh hello we've got someone from singapore as well brilliant Amazing. Um, yeah international so if the patients just had surgery should and um, should they already have a group and save done do they need to do a cross match and a group and save again or so, so I think it's most most patients uh, will have had a group and say prior to their surgery being um, done, and it really depends on where you, where you work uh, in terms of the policy of the hospital. So um, most places that I've worked they require if you're going to get a blood transfusion they'll require a second group and save um, and that normally they won't also give you that second you will need that second group and save within three days 
Um, so if I think someone's sort of, you know, if their bleeding is worth giving a, a phone call to the lab and see if there's a value we can save there. Um, and if that, if there is, then it, you, you don't need to take one, but, um, but otherwise it's quite important to do so. Okay. Um, just a quick one. What did you mean by abdominal causes of respiratory dysfunction? Uh, so that's things like, for example, so if you've got, uh, if you've got, um, so I'm trying to think of the best way of saying it. So if, for example, you've got like an abdominal mass or you've got irritation to your peritonism or to your sort of peritoneal uh, layer or anything like that, it can have impacts in terms of it can affect your diaphragm. Um, so if there's something pressing there where you're bleeding and you get irritation, um, that can cause that can cause difficulty with your breathing. Um, and again, there's a pressure or mass effect depending on where, where you are and what's going on post surgery. So, again, raising your diaphragm will cause can cause issues. Um, with your breathing pattern. Okay. Um, what would you recommend would be a good antiemetic for opioid induced nausea? Ah, oh, that's a good question. That's a, that's a talk in itself um, because it depends on the cause of their, of their emesis, but um, it, it really depends on the patient of what, what the cause is. And there's different antiemetics for, um, for different, different situations, really. I mean, as a sort of you know your your post-operative i think a lot of people use things like your 5-ht3 or things like ondansetron is quite useful but um but it's a very sort of broad answer and there's a lot more sort of uh, nuances unfortunately that we don't have time to go into so just on that note could you would you recommend prescribing metoclopramide if you suspected ileus or should you do imaging to rule out a mechanical obstruction first no, I think if you're querying a mechanical obstruction, because metoclopramide or dompodin, they're both prokinetic um, antiemetic, so um, they, they can worsen the, um, basically if there is a mechanical obstruction. So um, I would not, I would not give those, but uh, I would consider doing imaging first. Yeah, uh, a quick one uh, for a portable chest X-ray: Will the radiologist report or interpret it there and then, or the F one's expected to? That's uh, that's a fair question. It depends where you work. So, um, uh, as I'm sure you'll be aware, if you work, Alice knows, if you work at Imperial, it'll get reported very quickly. Uh, everywhere else, it won't. So, um, I think I think it's a useful skill worth having and being able to interpret it yourself. And um, the other thing with portable X-rays is everywhere you have to just call the radiographer on call to um, ask them to come to the ward. Um, and they'll always be like, they'll always be like, can't the patient come down? And I think the sort of the magical words are they're hemodynamically unstable. So just say that. <laughs> okay. Um, if a patient develops a fever post-op, what are the indications for another surgery or should they be treated with antibiotics only? Um, I think it depends on the type of fever that they develop um, and whether you suspect that there's uh, the cause of the infection going on. So, um, for example, if they're having repeated swinging fevers and you can't necessarily find the sores, then you might think that there is an intra-abdominal collection, which you might want to go ahead and drain. But if there's a clear source like chest or urine or something like that, then you won't do, you won't, you know, go back post-operatively. Um, and if, if it's a transient fever that lasts only a few days, you're unlikely to, um, to go back either. So I, th I think it really depends on the nature and how unwell they are and whether you think that, for example, if there is an abdominal surgery, if there is an intra-abdominal cause. Okay. Um, with post-op pyrexia, I may have missed it, but what did WALK refer to? The five W's. Is it BCE? Gosh, I think that was superficial infections. If you're on a night shift, what would you definitely escalate to a senior ASAP? Uh, so I think, I think if you, as a rule of thumb, so I think if you're worried someone's unwell and you're worried that they could deteriorate, so anyone, I wouldn't worry about escalating to your senior. I think at the beginning, if you're unsure, escalate more and you'll get a feel quite quickly for what you can and what you can't manage. Um, I think that any of these cases would be appropriate to escalate. So, you know, things like your septic patient or your ble post-op bleeding. Um, I, th I think it is, it is worthwhile. So anyone who's got any hemodynamic, like significant hemodynamic compromise, I think it's worth escalating. But at the beginning, for sure, I think um, everyone expects you to ask uh, questions and to escalate things. Um, and then towards the end of like F1, this will all be like routine. It will, it will just um, come naturally.
Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for another a couple more quick ones. If everyone yeah. could keep completing the feedback form for Sadiq as well. Um, if a post-op patient is spiking temperatures for a few days, is there any point in repeating a blood culture? Uh, the short answer is yes, because some organisms take several days to culture um, and they could have something subacute going on, like an endocarditis, and it might not show up in their blood cultures for like maybe a week or so. So yes, is the answer. Okay. And um, last one, how quickly can we get cross-match results? Do we get a cross-match done and use Oneg blood in the meantime until their result comes back? And then do we swap? Yes, yeah, so you can use like, in, if you, you can get, you can get Oneg blood, but I, I think it depends on where you work, but cross-match is fairly quick in most places. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Sadiq. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in from no, Singapore and elsewhere. And we will see you all next week as well. Dreamy. Thank you.